So um, I was um, observing the activities from the distance, but I never found time to come here, so it's great to be here. I've been working in, uh, uh, in text mining and uh, recently in semantic web technologies. So um, I will give you my bigger picture. So usually I'm very reluctant to say my bigger picture, but this time around I will show you my bigger picture. And um, so it's a little bit of a ride which goes from my past into my current position and which brings together all the different components. Actually, I'm, I'm now a professor at the University of Ireland in Galway and I'm directing the Insight Center for Data Analytics and uh, what I will show you a little bit of my past and how this came about and um, how, what I'm doing now. So I give you also some overview of what Insight is doing and then I explain you what we do in the biomedical domain. This is my fourth time that I changed career. So this is my fourth different career position I had in my life and I will show you this in a minute. So Galway, this is what you see when you go on the web. You find a nice street and nice houses and a lot of people in the street and this is exactly what, what uh, Galway is about. Well, if you talk to people in Galway, this is what they tell you. It's rain, rain, and a lot of rain. And there's some days with a lot of rain. And, well, I saw a little bit of this. So this is a picture I took. Uh, this is what you can find. But you can find also a lot of other things. So this is in the summer. So this is the river which goes to Galway. And you see a lot of people there. It's a very popular city. It's amazingly popular. It's in the west part of, uh, of Ireland. It's one of the most western parts of Europe anyways. So it's, uh, it's pretty, um, uh, in, the, in the summer it's packed. And you find this. It's wonderful weather. I've never seen this before. So there's all the skies, cloud formation, sun. This is really, really exciting. And sometimes over the sea, you get some kind of features of the sun behind the clouds and old sites you can visit. And this is a, not a single cloud. Nobody would believe me this if I talk to Irish people. Not a single cloud a whole day long does exist in a beautiful old castle which was on the seaside. And then the most famous part is the Cliffs of Mohair. They are 250 meters high. You can go right to the brim, look down, and jump down if you want. You better don't. It's, uh, nobody came up ever. So, so this is Galway. Galway is an exciting place. So I give you an overview over um, what I've been, uh, what Insight is doing, then about my past and my uh, what I've been doing at um, that time. I give you an overview of the different research going on in Insight, only to explain that we are doing semantic web, and not on, only biomedical. Different types of semantic web. And actually, Insight was one of the building partners of the linked data cloud of this big thing that was shown before. And, um, and then I go down to the biomedical part where my core um, expertise lies and into the challenges from bench to the bedside. Well, semantic web for me is not only the text mining which goes into the semantic web, it's a lot more. So Insight is um, actually not only Galway. There's four different sites. That's one is in Galway, one is two are in Dublin. So this is Dublin uh, City University, and this is University uh, C Dublin, University College Dublin, and one is in Cork. Um, and inside in Galway, work 120 staff members, 28 senior researchers, postdocs, and 56 PhD students. We are funded for six years, four years to go, and two weeks I have my review. So I'm. <laughs> It's a pretty hot period for me now, but I think my work is already done, so I can go safely back at the end of the week and uh, continue with this work. And we have to do significant work with commercial partners. So this is one, one part where I've put, put a lot of effort in. We not only do research, we have to do research where we find somebody who pays us some money for the research too. And the research applications, so this is a pretty big domain. I will show you some parts of it, but there's a medical part which is about, uh, well, towards personalized medicine, connected health, bringing different data types together. But then there's a part which is about personal sensing. So using devices to measure a person, to measure, for example, how much load is on a knee and then to observe whether the person is doing the right training or not. This is done in Dublin. And then there is some chronic disease management where by uh, electronic means some kind of uh, measurements are done and analyzed to find out whether the patient is on the, on the way to rehabilitation. But we have also other parts like uh, smart enterprises, how to steer uh, solutions. For example, one partner is working on an, an, a device which enables companies like Google to optimize their energy efficiency. So they are calculating during the day how much 
energy is used and then uh, put this to the cheapest uh, energy uh, provider. And we analyze news and media, we do e-government. I'll give you a little bit more details um, on this a bit later. But the key thing is we tackle web scale data. So a semantic web using all, providing data standards, using all the data which is available. We develop different approaches to process the data. So for example, um, there's something which is stream processing. We use sensor data, analyze this more or less on the fly. Do research on, um, on public data, e-government, bioinformatics, digital humanities, and we more or less exploit everything that is linked open data. And the institute is also recognized as an open data institute. So we are providing teaching this initiative which was started by Tim Berners-Lee. And so there's a kind of a connection of institutes around the world who all have signed up and then uh, make stuff available to do teaching in open data usage. Um, we do as well commercial and academic uh, approaches. So we do web technologies as a platform and uh, for example, transform literature into structured content, we make use of the public resources and we make use of all the linked open data. This is kind of the structure. Um, so we have something like a linked data infrastructure. So this is kind of a machinery where data can be put and serviced to the public. We make use of social data, which is Twitter and Facebook. We use graph data, which is graph analysis. We use stream data. This is data coming from, from sensors, text data. And then we have different application domains like data journalism, bioinformatics, digital humanities, e-learning, and financial services. So this is all about insight, and this is my CV, so I show you now my four career changes. So I'm actually a true medical doctor, and I found this awfully boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it was my... <laughs> so I was doing research at that time, and my research was great, but I didn't want to continue, it didn't work out, so I switched to computer science. I did a computer science degree. And then I had this really marvelous plan. I put this together, medical science, medical science and computer science, and I make medical informatics. So I went to the GSF, as Dino mentioned, and I had this really brilliant project where we would have been the number one team doing visualization of 3D data from a patient. Unfortunately, my supervisor had a problem with the supervisor of the other collaborator. He killed this project, and then I said goodbye. So this was a project which could have brought me to the journal, uh, the, the English uh, Journal of, of Medicine or into Lancet, so I would have had an impact factor of 30 on this one publication. My supervisor didn't realize that this was a good thing, so I said goodbye. And then I went to Lion Bioscience, which was all about bioinformatics in a company, so I said goodbye to my academic career. And at that time, I was lucky enough, I got a, a 3.5 million euro grant to do text mining at that time. It was really, really early, it was in 1998. And so we started off and we ran work for two years and had really cool technology working. And then all of a sudden the company was restructuring. I ended up in consulting and nobody was interested in our technology. I said, goodbye, this is not my thing. And then at the same time, somebody told me I should go to the EBI and they had a position open for pathway analysis. And um, they, they told me, hey, you should apply there. You should do your thing there. And um, I said, well, this has nothing to do with text mining. It's not even saying text mining in the application. I said, well, go there, convince them. They have to do it. It's something which they need. And then I went there, I convinced them, and then I stayed there for nine years. And then for personal reasons, I left there and went to Zurich to do um, a very special project in multilingual uh, literature analysis. And uh, well, the next thing is now insight. So every, all of a sudden in insight, everything that I've done before, comes together, but everything that I've done before is now in place to do this at a larger scale at Insight. So my research is in immunology, bioinformatics, literature analysis, biomedical semantics, and I've developed a couple of tools, built the Journal of Medi Biomedical Semantics, and ran a couple of challenges. So this shows you the domain where I'm in, in an overview. So I think you know all these boxes here, but I will still explain them. So the number one thing we are known for is entity recognition in genes, diseases, and all kinds of types, and doing concept recognition, gene ontology. I still remember my first bio-creative challenge where we took part, 
was the worst title of a paper that you can ever imagine. It was the paper was entitled Methods Used for BioCreative 1A or something like this. It was not even explaining anything about the method. But what we did at that time is we took the entities from the databases and we tried to find them in the text. And then we went to BioCreative and explained to everybody, hey, we took the database and tried to find these entities. And everybody was asking us, why do you do this? The database has nothing to do with these entities. It was only us because we were in, at the EBI, we were dealing with the database and we knew that we have to combine both of them, that we did this, but nobody else was doing genomalization at that time. So I missed this number one opportunity to write this grand paper, which would have been cited 1,000 times till today, talking about genomalization at a time where nobody was thinking about it. But, but there are things which are worse. So we did all this entity recognition, concept recognition, and we did all these extraction of lexical entities from the databases and use them to normalize them. I think we had a very crude approach with some basic disambiguation, but it worked fine. I think it gave a great technology, made this available. And then we used a lot of XML to do the data representation. We also extracted a couple of facts or events. And we did a little bit of inference and reasoning, somewhat validation of database content. But you see already, this is kind of the, the way to go going from whatever you call an entity, linking them up with the other data resources, bringing this into a standardized data representation, and then making use of it in the database. I will give you a couple of examples on this. And um, in my timeline, it runs down, so most of you know this. Initially, we built a lot of tools because we thought this was great to have an infrastructure which is uh, promising. Then we had to focus on entity normalization, so this was really a lot of work. And then we developed a couple of standards which we are using. So I'm, I coined this term, the Silver Standard Corpus, which is now still kind of floundering around and getting more and more interest. So it's not the gold standard. The Silver Standard is big. It has been generated semi-automatically and um, contains a lot of entities. And in terms of the tools, uh, you know, all the what is a tool. So whenever I go to a conference, people ask me what they should use, and I tell them what they should use, what is it. And then they ask me, what is it, what is it? And um, so this is my legacy naming, which will be troublesome all in the future. We built a couple of other tools which do um, identification of entities, relations, and here is a con condenser which we have developed. And here are the two challenges. The Kalbik challenge was about the question, how can we do one million Medline abstracts with about 50 million entities, annotate them about five different semantic types, the precision is not, not excellent, but a couple of people have used them for a couple of machine learning experiments. And then later on, we transformed the same approach to the multilingual case. So we took a lot of parallel documents, identified the different languages, the entities, aligned the different documents, and then identified uh, synonymous or translations of terms. So the conclusion from my past, Data integration in the biomedical domain was my key thing. The number one thing that I drove was use the standard data resources. And we were very often very crude with, with our approaches. I think um, this is, um, but it gives very interesting input in terms of what can be reached. We use large scale resources. And uh, I think one specialty was I never really built a database. We were always doing processing on the fly. So we had a lot of machine resources and it was quite nice to do this at EBI. So looking at insights, so this is now the different topics that we are dealing with in insights. I wanted to give you an idea what data analytics and semantic web can be. I selected a few examples. So the, the typical example is that we would use something like DBpedia and then identify in the whole semantic web graph entities which have a lot of links. So this is the typical, let's say, page rank approach or way to find the interesting topics or terms. And then we would use these uh, specific topics which are in the center of graphs and um, label them with, uh, with all the different interpretations which can be found and build uh, such small knowledge graphs which represent um, individual entities. So this is something which you can call ontology learning from a structured database. And so we use already the well-structured resource like DBpedia and um, kind of normalize the entities and read out what they are about and build larger topic graphs. And there are a lot of uh, variants to this approach. 
So for example, you can use uh, um, other resources like WordNet. You can find a lot of senses to, uh, to, you can find a lot of words representing the same sense. And then you can optimize this ambiguation techniques. So this is core technology. Another thing is um, we have an NLP group, which is run by Paul Baltelar. And there's one thing which is uh, very specific here. And they also do a lot of text mining and text analysis. But they have built a solution how to translate ontology labels into different languages. So this is something we are, which we are still waiting for. It's something we have all these ontologies which are existing. But there's not any techniques how to use them in different languages. For the biomedical domain, this will be required, at least for the European level. So this is a very nice outcome here. And then another project which is kind of interesting is this one. So here, we work together with Elsevier. We process the scientific literature and take out more or less everything that is known about an author. And then we look into other data resources, like blogs and Twitter. And we try to find the same author, the same author talking about uh, his research. And by using then the information about the author, I'm not sure whether I have a second slide, um, we try to align this. And the task is to find new metrics to measure an author. So because an author is also giving his output to other media, and an author who is very active in a certain public media, may get a higher ranking because he's contributing more. So now we can have a long discussion whether this makes sense or doesn't, but it's at least uh, useful enough that a company puts money into it. So they are kind of watching what's going on and, and they continue this project. So this is a typical thing to do author disambiguation. And I want to show you another project which is a little bit further away from literature, which is about stream processing and Internet of Things. But it's something which will be relevant for the future in the clinical domain. So uh, we have two research teams working on the question on, let's say, smart technologies. They take sensors, like this room has a lot of temperature sensors and light sensors, and has shades, and has sun coming in, has people sitting in here. So we can pack it with sensors and observe where the people are sitting. We can monitor the heat. We can observe where the sun is shining in. And it can take a decision whether the shades, uh, the shades have to go down or not. And the more intelligent, intelligent this is, the less energy is used in the room. We can optimize. But you have a decision problem here. Because you have this one room, you have all the rooms here, you have all the sensors, you have the whole building, you have a lot of information. All these sensors setting all this information to the central server is sitting somewhere in the cloud and have some kind of database. And then you take a decision there, and in some rooms the shades go up, and the other ones they go down, and it can be awfully wrong. So you have a lot of data, and you have to take quick decisions. And this is something which needs good solutions. So the problem here, there's large data volumes. The, day, the decision time is very short. We need some kind of semantic integration to allow uh, good decision making for humans and machines. And um, getting all together right is quite a difficult problem. And, but this leads to the result that the, the groups are building sensor wrappers which are capture the information, then this information is transformed into linked data and is uh, analyzed against the linked open data cloud to interpret what's going on. So what is a hot room, what is a cold room? And then there's a query engine on top, which allows um, to embed rules to find the specific connections which give a decision point. And then there's an interface to, to drive this. And this is the same thing in the clinical domain. So you have a lot of, if you take an intensive care unit, you have a lot of devices there, and they need to be controlled. So, and in some sense, what we want is that these machines communicate and then take decisions together. And that's why personal sensing is very important. Here's a couple of examples where this is used. The one example is smart cities, where uh, for example, traffic information is uh, streamed together to find out whether the traffic flow is right, and then decisions have been taken there. In health management, uh, well, this is a little bit more tricky to explain. Um, it's about the fact whether certain resources like personal is used efficiently in healthcare. Then we have smart homes where um, 
a lot of devices in the rooms are monitoring what's going on. This is where Google has now entered the field and want to be involved in in processes and solutions. And then there's something like smart enterprises who have big big buildings or a lot of devices which have to be brought together. We are working together with Cisco on this Bell Labs. We have a project called City Pulse, which is um, bringing smart cities together. And the last thing I want to present here, I think, is the e-government. So one part is uh, we are dealing a lot with open data. That's why the government is coming to us and asking us how to deal with the open data. So the typical question is, um, if I have now the whole map of Ireland, then I can look at the crime rates. I can look at the crime rates in different locations. And then the question now is, if I have a certain high crime rate in one location, is it truly dangerous there? And then the next question is, are children at risk? So they try to predict where they have to send their social workers to identify those spots where children need special attention. And then it could be somewhere around a nightclub or it could be somewhere around a certain hotspot where drugs are dealt with. And, uh, and so we are dealing with, with um, we are giving the government advice. So we are giving advice how to use the data, but we also give advice how to make data available. But we also do analyses whether a government is giving you making use of uh, open data policies. So here's a very nice diagram which the research team has produced. They looked at all the different countries in Europe and elsewhere, and then they pulled out different parameters, whether they give data away, whether they are um, whether the crime rate is low, safe communities whether they uh, fight corruption by making information available, and then they gave a scoring system. So the interesting work here is to find these scores. And then you have all the different European countries, and Ireland is doing kind of okay. And then here you find that Israel is also doing kind of okay and has a red bar here, which is the safer community. So it's not very safe here in, in and Japan, 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 Japan is not on here. So it's certainly further down the, further down the line. And here's, some countries which are a little bit more tricky. Okay, so this was insight about everything else. <laughs> I know that, um, but I, mean, I know that a lot of these things that we are doing and uh, dealing with is um, is relevant for the future and helps us to do also the biomedical task. So I now come to the biomedical part. So this is the core where I'm sitting and where I get most of my expertise, and. Um, so I caught it from the bench to the bedside, which is some of the things which are done here, doing genomics data, proteomics data, bringing out causes of disease, and then helping clinicians to take the decisions. And I pulled out a number of examples which go the same direction. So we call this translation medicine. So we have basic research on the one side, and then we want to bring this into the clinical practice. And in theory, we have information going from the basic research to the clinical site. But then the clinical practice is also coming back and asking questions. They want to know specific conditions and want to learn how uh, specific cases for the treatment of the patient have to be considered. A typical example is um, if I have a patient with a specific condition and I want to give him a drug, is the risk high that this person gets the drug? And then the different data which goes in is the patient records. We want to read them. Data access is still critical. Then we have the public biomedical data. So structured in, in the best case, structured in semantic web technologies. You want to understand the full wealth of it. So ideally, the full public biomedical data fits together, gives a nice logical structure, and we can just use it in the different pieces. We are not yet there. And then we have protected data by pharmaceutical companies. And so they are doing their clinical trials. They are capturing their own information. They don't necessarily give it to the public, but then they want to use the public data, pull it into their research, and then make clever decisions before everybody else understands what's behind this disease. So we are, I have been working together with pharmaceutical companies who wanted to get the full data into a shared infrastructure, so they paid me for this, only to use it themselves. I was even allowed to make it publicly available, so it was no issue. It was only the fact that they don't have to do it themselves one by one. And um, here's an overview of, this is from a paper that we have published this year in briefings in bioinformatics. So we have done an analysis about translation medicine. This is the work of Katia Marcato in Portugal. 
and uh, working together with Francisco Couto. We have looked over the different approaches. So there was an approach in cardiovascular disease. So these are all approaches in semantic web technologies. They are all claiming to do translational medicine. They all have a topic and they all integrate some kind of data resources. So there was one approach in cardiovascular disease, one in hypercholesterolemia, and one in cere cerebrovascular disease. These sound different, but they're in the same corner. So these are all diseases which have to do with um, cardiovascular disease. So this is for the neurological case, and this is um, hypercholesterolemia is inducing cardiovascular disease, or is at least one of the core resources. And these are the resources that they have been using. And you see there is a little bit of overlap what they have been using, but the approaches have been largely different. So these were interested in the SNPs and in the, in the, in the mutations. These were more interested in the pathways, and this was doing a rather um, shallow approach using pathways and SNOMED. Then we have a couple of other ones which are a little bit more diverse. So Diabetes Cecil was my project. Then there's one in pharmacology, one in neuroscience, and one in dystrophy. We have again a couple of resources which are used over and over again. Then here are again resources which are used over there, so quite similar. And then here we have additional resources. So the diversity is still quite high, what the different groups are using. And if you look a little bit more closely, we find that most of them use public data, this is true. And some of them use private data, so some of them have been in, um, in using patient data, for, for example, cervical cancer and colon cancer. And they have, as a bridging element, there are a couple of approaches that use public and private data. So in our case, the private data is not patient data, but literature. But the number one take home message here is that it's not a contradiction to have public data and to use private data on top. I think it's the other way around. We should as, make as much public data available and then to see how to import it into the environments where private and protected data is used. And when looking over, so the, the diagrams are all in the paper, so easy to find. And then the other thing that we found is that out of these projects that we have analyzed, most of them are still exploratory. So they just put together data. They put together data to find something. And only few of them use inference. So few of them go one step beyond and use inference technologies to make some reasoning on top of it. So we are not yet there. So the inference is the key thing. This is what we need, I think, for the future. So this is our approach, only to show you how it was set up. So this is a civil project. The idea was to get fine genes for diabetes mellitus. We had four pharma companies involved and four publishers. The four publishers was uh, Biomed, uh, Biomed, no, it was uh, Nature Publishing Group, Elsevier, um, Royal Society of Chemistry, and the fifth one, fourth one was uh, BMC at least, Elsevier. And they all agreed in the beginning that they would make the data public, and three of them did. The fourth one didn't. Easy to guess which one it was. But uh, it was not nature. <laughs> so nature didn't have a problem here. And every meeting, we talked about the business model. So all the farm companies and all the publishers, they are always, every meeting, every month. But we still did all work. So we brought together the different data resources, Array Express, UMLS, Disease Ontology, Gene Ontology, and Unipod. And this is the full text literature from the publishers. And these are the number of triples. So there was roughly something like uh, 15 million triples out of the public data resources, and roughly something like uh, 50 million out of, the, out, of the, out of the literature. And this is what you find. You find the different data resources. Gene Atlas is expression profiling, pancreas data, and here's OMIM, candidate genes for diabetes. There's Uniprot, also giving genes for diabetes. And there's the full text literature. So what you find is that OMIM and uh, Uniprot, there's shared, there's a number of shared genes. So this is boring. This is everything that is known. This is nothing of interest, because we know them all. We may add Gene Atlas, and then it becomes already a little bit more exciting, and then you add the literature, and then we find 19 genes over here, which are confirmed between gene atlas, gene expression profiling, and the literature. And then there's four 
which are even supported by Uniprot. So these may or may not be interesting. And these, these 19 plus 4 are the interesting ones. And this is why you do such a project and pay 200,000 pounds to get this funny list out of it where all the positive and negative support genes are in. And then a pharma company can go and say, well, pure nonsense, false positives, or interesting, you go for this one or that one. So this was a data integration project, and we found a couple of genes and um, then published the work. Here's another project which may be interesting for you because this is about protein-protein interactions, but it's slightly different from the normal protein-protein interaction projects. So it's using different data resources, BioGrid, Thedit, HD and C quorum, gene expression profiling, does the normal data analysis, builds a triple store, makes this available, and um, then finds a number of, of um, representations. But the interesting thing here is this is protein protein interactions, so this is what more or less everybody does. Then it pulls out complexes, which is uh, protein protein interactions which go to the same final protein. And there's domain-domain interaction, which is coming from the genomic data. So here the interesting thing is that these are the known protein-protein interactions. And here are links between, uh, this comes from a speci special database where in the nucleus, certain DNA strands are compared to find out which part of a strand is closely interacting with another strand from another chromosome. So these are potential candidates which are, um, which are co-regulated and may end up in either a complex or protein-protein direction. So the products which are generated or co-regulated may be in any of these two. So by finding everything from this minus these ones gives interesting hypothesis about new interactions. And while you do the typical thing, you bring together the data resources, you look for uh, shared classes and uh, shared entities and bring them together and then uh, make them available. And here's yet another project, only to inspire you to, to show you what can be done. What are projects which are of interest? What, where do we find interesting projects? Here's one which is about uh, cancer. So TCGA is a cancer database. Here's a database about somatic mutations. And uh, then there's, um, and these, basically these two data resources are brought together. Again, building a semantic web approach. And the interesting thing here is from the different data resources, we get um, copy number variations, complete mutations, and um, other mutation loci. And um, so we, we pull out different kinds of, um, of variations in particular from COSMIC, and then try to take a decision whether a mutation is leading to an activation or to an active variant, which could be inducing a cancer. So we are pulling out different, different uh, variations to activate it and repress it, and uh, try to figure out whether this leads to an activation of um, cancer-causing protein or um, active element, or whether this reduces the cancer-causing elements. And the last one, a little bit more general, um, we use uh, Wikipedia to filter out, this is a topic labeling approach, we filter out different um, uh, genetic elements which are then represented in a topical graph, and this topical graph um, is sorted according to genetics, biology, population genetics, and conservation. So this is giving an overview of the different topics which are, um, which are relevant for the pharma companies. One particular issue is um, access to private data. To, um, so if, if you use data from the clinical domain, how do we use it? So we had one research project where in the semantic web approach we enabled um, roles in the Sparkle endpoints. So we were working together with different hospitals. They gave us access to their data. But whenever you started a Sparkle query, you had to disclose your role, and then you could only see part of the data. So this is something which in the future will play an important role. So this is a, 
uh, we call it the Policy Aware Sparkle Query Federation. And we are involved in several health standards, World Wide Web, HL7, and uh, contributed team to the standards. And also working together with different companies who are, who are doing this. Unspecific core. Okay, so looking a little bit into the future. The, so these were different projects that I was running, or that we are running. I think ideally, everything comes together. So uh, this is the vision of the semantic web. And we may be still quite a way away. But these kernels which I've shown you, I think this is exactly what we need. We need exactly such kernels around specific topics. This is my way to work. I always ask myself, what do I want to deliver? Well, what is the outcome in the end? So for example, the genes for diabetes, can I put mutations in a context that we can query and filter out combinations of mutations which may increase the risk of cancer? Can I, ident I, can I identify certain modifications to phenotypes which are induced by drugs? <laughs> and uh, so this is how my thinking works. But ideally, on a bigger picture, we have the linked data, we have the semantic web approaches, we have the ontologies and the knowledge bases. And how they exactly fit together, this is still hard work, but there's a lot of questions sitting around it which are relevant for the future. So personalized medicine and translation medicine is certainly in the heart of what we're doing or what I'm doing. But personalized medicine is a little bit more focused to the patient to take decisions on his own specific risks. Um, biotech companies want to know new targets, want to know where to invest to find new drugs. Then there's a lot of agriculture food modification going on, animal breeding, very important for Ireland. Ireland is one of the uh, top breeding sites for, for beef. They have um, every animal, any cow in Ireland is tagged and genotyped and monitored and followed up. And um, so there's a big effort in uh, positioning Ireland as one of the first breeding sites for beef. Drug discovery, epidemiology is very interesting to use public data to find out whether certain risks are related to um, certain backgrounds, genetic backgrounds, then healthcare monitoring and optimizing of healthcare services. And this is how it fits together conceptually. This is how I think the data resources fit together. This comes from a grant proposal which I've submitted some time ago. And the key information that we are using is protein protein interactions and function. Actually, the function, the molecular function, is still the most important resource for finding relevance of a gene. And this has an impact on the phenotypes. So a cellular function translates into a functioning or a dysfunction phenotype. So here is a link which is very important, but this box is still very much unspecified. So we use very often diseases as phenotypes, but phenotypes are a little more complex. It's um, difficult to describe, but this is under development. And, but there are some workarounds which are very interesting. One workaround is going over mouse phenotypes. So a lot of experimental information is in mouse phenotypes, captured in mouse phenotypes. So you cannot do experiments with humans, but you can do them with the, with the mouse. And now the only question is how similar or different is a mouse from a human? And in principle, they look quite different, but genetically, they are not so much different. They are still different. But um, So aligning these two gives a high benefit. And we, I've worked on this in the past, so it works to a certain degree. And um, so we can learn a lot through this trace here. And then certainly drug activity plays a role, because we can observe in the hospital how drug activity changes the phenotype. And um, then there's a couple of other things like mutations which modify the genes. And from a different perspective, what happens is that uh, we have the linked open data. Now, what we are talking about here is the scientific literature, how to make out of scientific li literature linked open data. Then, from my perspective, the biggest important thing on top of what we can do today is getting the phenotypes out. This is still quite difficult, but I think this is coming. And then certainly getting the gene disease associations out and uh, moving this into knowledge discovery. And
And here is yet another view. And this is also, I think, under development. So what you see is that um, we are um, we use the patient records to read out what a patient is or what kind of diseases this patient has. But increasingly, the, the laboratory data comes on top of it. So not only describing a patient, hey, he looks a little bit red or he looks a little bit weak or he has uh, some kind of symptoms, getting the the biomedical information, the biomarkers, is becoming very, very important. So, a couple, well, we know a lot of them, but really knowing exactly how they relate to the phenotype is a lot of work. And I can give you a very nice example for this, which is uh, more genetic than, than about the laboratory data. But there's a lot of uh, rare diseases which are known, and a lot of them are monogenetic. So if you have this gene, then you die, more or less. No way to survive. And this is published in OMIM, and all of a sudden we do genotyping of patients, and we find a couple of them who have the gene, but they're not dead. So there's a problem. So is this now a false positive? Certainly not. So this is a, we just don't know enough about the mutation. And the same is true for a lot of the biomarkers. So we are still in the phase to learn this, and they are not only the literature plays in, but a lot of biobanks. The biobanks have one big problem, is to get the phenotypes sorted out. So phenotypes is again a question to solve. And then there's a couple of trends which go even more into the future. So health variables, you all know Apple and Apple Watch, and you can monitor your heart rate. But you not only monitor your own heart rate, uh, but you have your, also your spouse or lover or whoever, and you monitor the heart rate of your spouse or lover, and you know, oh, it's still alive, great. So we monitor all this uh, information, and gather this, so this is catching on like crazy, but what do we do with the data? So if something is negative, is this a reason to go to the medical doctor or not? Then you all know IBM Watson and patients like me. So there's a lot of advanced data analytics going on, and it's a little bit scary. Google is also active with a whole research center, only trying to figure out how to capture the healthcare market with data analytics. Then we have personalized medicine, the different approaches to use genomic data, sports, nutrition, aging, treatment, and systems medicine. So, last slide, challenges. What challenges do we face? So these are the challenges where I could think about well, the last two or three days, and they're still quite a lot. So, but I think uh, no reason to give up. So the most important thing is the reliable concept representation between data resources going back again to my entities and to my solutions and my kind of big challenges and uh, but we are not yet there. So shared URIs in the first place for identical concepts. So even this, although we know this, is not yet in place. Then identification of identical concepts between data resources. So if, if something has the same label, do I know that this is the same label? This is the same concept if it has the same label. Then we have, apart from the same label concepts, we have um, concepts which are similar on and non-same. So there's a little bit of ambiguity or a little bit of um, subspecification or generalization going on. And there we can use uh, graph-based analysis to find synonymous or quasi-synonymous concepts. So this needs a little bit more science. And the same approach is certainly for the relations. Then I point already to the roles into the access of open data. So from now in the future, patient data is never public. So we always have to find ways how to make this accessible and to keep track of the roles. So this is a little bit a nasty thing, but uh, there's no way around it. Then provenance is an issue. So where does the data come from? And the key thing is to judge whether the data is reliable or whether there is some risk with the data. And I haven't seen yet any levels of reliability and risk. I only see that a lot of provenance goes in. So there is a tricky thing. If you do a lot of provenance in, then the data becomes unmanageable. If you do it too sparse, then it's not reliable. So there's a tricky question. So we always kept provenance at the data resource level, but never put it down to the facts. But there's other ways which were a lot more advanced, and uh, I'm not sure which one. And then certainly reading the patient data, 
signal-to-noise ratio, anonymization, multilinguality, layman user-specific terms. This is the rather big.